Uh, my name is Mark Rappolt. I'm the editor-in-chief of Art Review and Art Review Asia. And Art Review is a magazine that was set up in 1949 and Art Review Asia I set up in 2013. Uh, so I studied art history, um, but much more classical, not contemporary. So I um, studied 18th century French sculpture and public space. Um, and then while I was doing that, I started working a bit with um, artists on writing projects, so with Louise Bourgeois, Gilbert and George, Sophie Cowell and then worked a bit with some of the former situationists after that, and then taught at the Architectural Association and ran their journal for a bit. I, I think in the, the initial instance, you need to know how to write, um, and you need to understand writing, and it's a written form, and, and that's really important. I think it's also something you have to just start doing. It's not something you wait around for someone to ask you to do. I think it's something you start doing, and that's where digital can come in as well, where you start publishing your own stuff. And I think not to hang around waiting for someone to approve you or um, to give you permission to do it. I think a lot of people sometimes are afraid of this. I think it's something you just start doing. And, you know, when I started, you just wrote to every single magazine and newspaper or emailed them saying, hey, I'm great, I want to do this. Um, and I think not being afraid of that and the personal contact. I think that's the same when you're... I mean, a lot of the early artists I wrote about, I just liked and I pestered them and emailed them and then just did stuff. And I think that's really important, not being afraid, because I think the art world and the publishing world can set up lots of barriers, I think, about ways you should do things. You, you shouldn't bother this person or that person. And I think you should just ignore all that and get on with it. They're normally people whose writing I've seen or one of the other editors has seen or someone we met and had a conversation with and they proposed some very interesting thoughts. Or sometimes they just know very much about a region we know nothing about. I mean, it's a real pleasure to work with a writer who's, I mean, talking about something you have no clue about and you're learning things from. And I think as an editor, you learn by every writer you edit or work with. And I think that's one of the, the pleasures of doing it, in a way. I would say it's an advantage to know art history, but it's absolutely not necessary. I mean, these things are things you can learn by studying on your own. I, I think I wouldn't always say a formal education is totally necessary, but it does give you a space to think, to discuss, and also to bounce people to bounce your ideas off. And in that sense, I think it's quite important. But I think, personally, I'm very much in favor of art history being important, because I think other ways you get caught up in this sort of idea of novelty and newness, this is new, that is new, when we all know that, that nothing can be new, you know, nothing comes from nothing. So everything is related, I think, to things that have come before, been adapted. Problems are not always new problems. They're often old problems that other people have dealt with before. And I think it's interesting to place things in this kind of uh, trajectory or history. It's not always a trajectory. And also to experience like the multiple histories from different parts of the world, the multiple modernisms, whatever. Um, I think a consciousness of that can help you better understand where we are now and to locate ideas not just in what happened yesterday, but in what happened 100 years ago or whatever. And I think this can be quite important. Um, so I think a lot of, I mean, I think I was very much always a pure writer in the first instance. And I think I became more and more interested over the last few years in other ways that research or study can be expressed. And exhibitions has been one of those things. Um, longer form writing, so more book type writing has been another of those things. And I think public conversations have been things that I never thought I'd be doing maybe 20 years ago, but have evolved as part of, I think, the same continuum of activities, but something that's more and more open in a way. So I don't always think that something I'm investigating and researching will become a piece of writing necessarily. It might also have other forms. So they were all interlink, but I think it's um, opening out to different ways of presenting what I'm interested in to some degree. I think there's a degree of research into the people you're talking to that you need to do. Um, I think meeting them beforehand is generally a good idea. So you're not sort of spending half the talk introducing yourself to them. Um, I also think that like, it's really important when you're moderating to listen. So not to just come with a prepared set of questions, but you listen to what someone says, like a normal conversation, and then respond to what they're saying. Because I think that's super important. You have a lot of talks, I think, where people have a fixed set of questions and they're sticking to that, despite the fact that someone may something, say something really interesting or totally absurd. 
um, in the conversation and then you don't pick up on it if you're too focused on your own agenda in a way. I mean, that would also be a big difference between, say, interviewing someone in a more journalistic way where you do have an agenda and you do want them to say certain things. Whereas I think when you're moderating in a talk, it's a discussion and it's about listening and responding. I think, I mean, I think when you're working with art, you're working with people who fetishize objects. And so maybe there's a slower erosion of print in art because of that. Um, but obviously digital has a wider reach. And at the moment we operate in both media. Um, but I think there's a question of velocity. So the stuff we do in the magazine is like longer pieces, heavily thought out. And the stuff we do digitally tends to be quick reaction pieces to things we see on an immediate level. But obviously as a distribution model, it works on a global way. So if you used to have a print magazine, it takes time for someone, say, in Australia to get it maybe three weeks after someone in Europe gets it. Whereas with digital, everyone gets it instantly. And that also changes the conversation you have with the audience a bit because the feedback is instant. Whereas, say, 10 years ago, someone might write you a letter or send you an email and it would be a much slower process before you felt the engagement of the audience with the publication. That's an interesting question, I think. Print publications and these kind of and books always serve as a kind of journal of record, a history that can't be changed. So if we print something, that's it, it's printed. We can't take it back. Um, I think with a lot of digital things, you can keep changing them, or the website, the URL changes, or where it's found changes. Um, you can change a review from positive to negative in about three seconds. And, you know, things get edited, corrected. And I think that's a very different kind of medium and I think there'll always be a place for this sort of fixed journal of record. It may be that that becomes more digital but I think that's where the interesting place between digital and print is the thing that's there said and not taken back and is just there and the thing that you're changing, modifying, flowing with different things, repurposing because a different kind of news story or something comes up or just adding to because an artist has done something different. So those things morph and change. And I think there's nothing wrong with that, but I think there's a place for both of them. I think what we're working towards is maybe to have more focused online microsites that focus on either specific themes, um, specific artists in some texts. We're also going to be 70 next year, so we're going to be digitizing a really huge archive. So Matisse used to write for Art Review in the, shortly before he died in the 50s. A lot of the sort of left-wing intellectuals like John Berger, John Copland, who went on to Art Forum. So there's a really interesting series of articles that I think primarily our research is going to be devoted to bringing those things back into a public conversation. So a lot of the early texts on pop art were in Art Review in the 50s. Um, there's some really surprising things about internationalism. So I think 40s, 50s, 60s. A lot of the art being covered was no less international than it is now, despite everything we say about communication, air travel. A lot of these dialogues already existed, and I think we're super interested in looking backwards and using the website to look at all these um, histories that maybe aren't so well remembered right now. I mean, obviously, bits are booming, and there's interesting dialogue opening up with um, Asian collectors becoming more active collecting non-Asian artists and art. I think that dialogue becomes interesting partly because of the previous history of Western engagement with Asia, which you know is framed by colonialism, trade, and various other things. And I think these dialogues and the way they relate to a, the way they relate to a sort of long history of engagement, rather than just like this is all new and it happened now. You know, it didn't. There's been engagement in different ways with Asia for a long time and with China, and I think it's interesting seeing it more in a continuum of a discussion rather than something brand spanking new. That was in some ways the least bad language um, because I think if we did it in Chinese, then it would be a, a magazine about China. If we did it in Japanese, it would be a magazine about Japan. And we're, I'm very interested in the kind of inter-Asia dialogue and um, the art history there as a whole and how it connects into each other historically and still today. Because I think there's this always assumption that everything is new in contemporary art, and a lot of it is linked to previous trends or previous movements in history. And I think that's really better tackled by something that covers Asia in a more wider sense. I mean, I think it comes back partly to this issue of language and, and the way things are done. 
So you're entering someplace else and I think you have to communicate in the way that people communicate. Um, for us, English, as I said, was very much about seeing a discussion that was more Pan-Asian um, and broader than just China. Um, but I think everywhere you go, you have to adapt to languages and customs and ways of doing things. Um, and this is also part of like a social dialogue. You know, you introduce yourself to someone, you try to be polite, you try to act in a way that's proper there. And I think it's a good thing to be learning other ways of doing things and other customs. I mean, we use WeChat just for Chinese, um, specifically for China. Um, and we would use other media specifically in other places where we felt it was necessary. But um, like I said, English was the least bad, bad language. Um, and you know, partly my family is more from Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, so my mother would speak Tamil and Malay. Um, and I was interested also when we were deciding on the language about, you know, how that works. So, you know, would it be that we would also do something in Malay because I have a heritage there, or we do something in Tamil because of that? And I think you can't, you have to choose one and with English as well, um, that's my native language, that's the language I edit in, it's the language I write in, so it would make sense if I was involved for it to be in English as well. No, that one is actually quite an editorial decision because I think at a certain point we felt the idea of an art magazine pretending it was covering art everywhere was ludicrous because it might be they were reviewed one show in Brazil every six months or and there's a sort of space limitation. So we started doing these special supplements or focuses in order to kickstart a longer term engagement. So fine with Brazil, after we did these special focuses, then we rolled that into the magazine. In the case of Asia, South Asia and East Asia, it very much became Art Review Asia, but it was a way with, of meeting writers who were based there, not wanting to be tourists, who just come in and look at it from our own perspective, but also engaging with a, I guess, a local perspective as well. So most of those projects end up folding into some aspect of the magazine as part of what it is as a whole. But they're really good for the sort of focusing um, an interest in developing writer contacts and doing research. So I think a lot of the projects at the moment have evolved from the magazine. So we do talks programs in Copenhagen, other places in Europe, involved a bit in some of them in Asia. Um, I'm thinking about what I can talk about and not at this point, but um, we curate a solo project section of the Westbund Art Fair, which is a public facing and a kind of commercial project. So it allows galleries to uh, experience an Asian art fair and an Asian market without having to invest in a, being a big presentation in a booth, which can be tricky. But it also allows a general public to experience the art because part of this project is a public art project um, to engage with Western art like in their own territory in a way. Um, as being present. So I think it, again, it helps generate conversations, discussions, um, likes and dislikes as well. And I think those projects are becoming really interesting. I think it's part of what the magazine was set up to do in the first place, which is to sort of engage a public audience and to argue for art as being a really important part of the civil society in the sense that it forms discussions, encourages tolerance, hopefully. Um, but also allows people to have that feeling of expressing their own ideas and tastes. So I think that's really interesting with those projects is when you meet ordinary people who wouldn't normally talk to you, but because this artwork's there, they start talking to you. And I think that's been super interesting in, in what we've done in Asia to some degree and also in, on a global level. So this is a collaboration with Kaza Wabi, which was set up by the artist Bosco Sodi. And I think we wanted to work with him and he wanted to work with us to do a kind of open call for a residency that sometimes these things can get very friend of a friend of a friend. And he was very interested in developing something that would be more open-ended and uh, reach out to people he doesn't know, we might not know. So we decided to work out an open call residency. So it could be you know anyone from anywhere. And most of the times when we go through the list for that, um, I'd say 99% of the people applying, we've never seen their work before. And I think that makes it much more interesting uh, both to work on the residency program and um, in terms of what might develop from it. So maybe it's much more experimental that way. Maybe there's a higher risk of failure or it not working out, but I think it opens it up as something that can have a diverse range of ideas and practices. So Art Review is funded by, uh, commercially by advertising, 
by subscriptions, by sales of the magazine, and by a number of other projects we do in parallel with the magazine as well. I mean, I think obviously you have to deal with that when you have a certain economy um, that requires a certain type of a cash flow, and that's always a struggle at the moment. But I think we do a lot of other projects that are not print-based. We organize talk programs in various places around the world, and um, also work with some collections as well, um, doing special projects with them. So I think that we're diversifying what we do, but I think it's also about playing a more active role in the art world. So you set out your beliefs in print or digitally, and then I think also now we're interested in how you act on that. Um, not so much, I think, I mean, that was started before I arrived, but it's very much about the fact that, say, my mother would assume that um, someone has an exhibition at the Tate, let's say, that artist is the best artist in the world and that's why they're having the show. And I think we wanted to look a lot at the kind of interconnected interests and structures that mean that some artists get more exposure, some get less. And to explore, I guess, the sort of infrastructure and framework of art as something that generates a certain public visibility for certain types of art and maybe not for other types of art. So we're very much interested in that structure. So I guess the sort of framework behind the art you see at institutions or at fairs like this. But I, I don't think you could make a solution out of one issue alone. So I think, of course, it, it does well and it's one of the biggest selling issues. But I think it also plays a role, you know, the artists making artworks about it. Um, I think it explains how this not particularly clear system that is the art world works to some degree. I mean, obviously nothing's completely transparent. So. I think it's a way of kind of scratching behind the surface a little bit of what goes on. Because, you know, while we're in Basel now and um, it looks like everyone in the world loves art, the reality is that art plays, in a lot of cases, a quite minor role in civil society. And we're interested in how that role might be developed and also for arguing why it's important. So there's a committee of people around the world, normally maximum about 26, um, where they talk about what's going on in their particular region, not on a global level, but, you know, does this gallery influence things? Does this artist influence things? And often it's, it's quite surprising what comes up because you may have artists who are not particularly exposed in a certain region, but are, are really influential in art schools and this way. So that group proposes who's important in the last 12 months in their region. And then we all get together and talk about how that relates to a more global picture. And that's the kind of tricky bit. Because obviously, quite often, given the list is still dominated a lot by Europeans and Americans, in some ways these might not really be that relevant in Asia or South America or other places in Africa. So it's always a balance and we try to be realistic about it. So we don't manipulate it too much. We don't say we have to have more representation from Africa because if the fact is that um, the art world isn't being influenced so much by this, then we shouldn't try and make that up. Um, but obviously the people who are not represented on the list are tell you something about the art world as well. Not particularly, I mean, it has been the case that people have stopped advertising for not being on the list. So the list is completely independent of that. And I think it has to be like that. So you have to just accept what it is. Um, the fact is that in some ways a, a bigger gallery will have a bigger budget and is more likely to be an advertiser anyway, but we keep the two things completely separate. I don't think there's ever been any particular conflicts. There have been angry people, um, but there's never been a kind of conflict in that sense. I think we, we have certain percentages we aim at. I mean, I think print advertising is a very difficult thing right now. Um, I think it's a sort of changing economy as we're moving into digital as well. But we work with a percentage of content to advertising. Collectively, so sometimes they're related to a theme that we're interested in. Sometimes artists make them. And sometimes it's an artist we've been interested in for a while. So Art Review, historically, since 1949, always had a portrait on the cover. But in the beginning, it used to be you know, pencil drawing or a painting. And using portraits a lot, I think, connects with that history and emphasizes that we're talking about people making works and works. And I think as a magazine, we're super interested in the way that art relates to a civil society, a society of a collective of people, and the role it can contribute to that. I think in the sense that you can choose to do an art fair or not do an art fair, you can choose to go to an art fair and not do an art fair, 
it, it's hard to say that there's a saturation. I think, you know, for a gallery from an economic model, I'm sure there is a saturation, but that's about making choices. So I think that's what I meant a bit about, you can't always just be a victim of this. Um, you have to make your own decisions and be aware of making your own decisions. And, and that's the same, this is as in life in general. I think Condo and some of the gallery exchange programs are interesting. I think partly because they build alternative networks and, and connections. Um, I think there's sometimes too much of a sense of victimhood about how things go in the art world and sometimes you have to take a deep breath and do something different. Um, and I think the models of conversation and exchange are becoming much more important and maybe more personal, which is a good thing because I think there can be something slightly abstract and anonymous and um, frightening about the art fair model, particularly for people who are not in the art world. And I think there are other ways of reaching out, of course, and I think pop-up shows, gallery exchanges, these kind of things. Public art is a sort of interesting one as well, and I think there's more and more interest in that. And I think those kind of ways with connecting with audiences and with colleagues to some extent are quite interesting. But I think it's also, you know, one of the other things we're interested in is language and art, right? So you pointed out that Art Review Asia is in English, and that means that certain types of conversation are very difficult or study are very difficult because you're imposing a language that's not native to the language in which the artwork was thought or intended and whilst you know art can be a universal thing it's also a very specific and particular thing so I think it's this balance between the universal the exchangeable the commodifiable and the particular the different the discrete is one of the balances that I think the art world as a whole is having to sort of deal with right now.